here. Um, so just we start this uh, panel with uh, uh, four participants, uh, and uh, we will start with uh, Light Sefan. Uh, so Light Sefan uh, is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Concordia University, and she is, uh, and uh, congratulations, uh, Light Sefan, assistant, a new assistant professor at Lina. Uh, university uh, starting uh, starting in uh, August 2017. So uh, congratulations and uh, uh, it's up to you. Well, thank you very much for coming uh, today. Um, this paper come, actually comes out of my dissertation, which I defended last year, and which I'm currently revising into a book manuscript tentatively titled "The Intermedial: Reading for Materiality in Between Old and New Media." I'm aiming to offer a hermeneutics of media ecologies through which one can read in between, among, and within layers of media interrelations, or what I'm thinking of as spaces of the intermedial. And at the same time, I'm comparing these relationships to the concurrent development of uh, to, uh, inscription technologies from writing to mechanical reproduction to digital representation. So in addition to reading into how media engage with uh, engage with and remediate each other in a networked ecology. I'm looking at how technological developments have shaped the historical and current ways in which we think and talk about media. How do we read into media ecologies that represent media as old and new, um, separate and converged, counter-historical media archaeology, or speculative and, and, and futuristic and post-humanism? How do we contextualize these representations with the politics, economics, and globalization of media that may direct the growth of media ecologies? Through thinking of media ecologies as, as structures that are actually quite multi-layered, multi-dimensional, I'm thinking to I'm seeking to complicate the idea of the in-between of media, adding as, aspects of depth to the intermedial, and, and this includes having to think about systems of media memory and erasure. And, and while I'm organizing these layers as part of my manuscript, what I'd like to talk to you about today is the position from which I began to ask these questions. How media engage with each other through intermediality, and how these engagements shift through, um, in, in, in regard to the, the advent of, of digital media, cultural representation. So there's a critical notion, framework, and practice. Intermediality has found unique exploratory ground in the digital, especially as the digital screen is often presented as this all-encompassing format that can remediate older and newer media. And what is unique about digital mediation is the amplification of its immediacy, or what Walter Brusen described as a, a visual representation that aims to be so realistic it offers the illusion that there is no mediation occurring, as if the object is actually there. And Walter and Grusin argue that the desire for an effectiveness of the uh, of, of immediacy has surmounted throughout the history of Western visual visual representation, quote, leading digital media to borrow avidly from each other as well as from their analog predecessors, unquote. And in this sense, through digital remediation, pre-digital media, or, or what is sometimes called old, or what are sometimes called old media are inscribed into the same data language through the computer process of transcoding so that they can be represented together on the digital screen interface. As such, I think of digital mediation as new and indeed new media are often considered new because of the particular ways in which they refashion older media and the ways in which they engage in an ecology of media. So by incorporating both older and newer media, onto the same representational platform of the digital screen, digital media more easily enable what Walter and Lucen describe as media borrowing, what can also be framed as um, what Daniel Pande calls media blending, what Alan Liu calls connectivity, and what Henry Jenkins calls convergence. The reason that digital representation poses an interesting problem for intermediality is because where one objective of intermediality is to analyze media interrelations, including by observing the significant alterities of, of, in, of the significant differences of, of media. Digital content production translates media into this language of bits and bytes, ones and zeros, really, uh, for on-screen representation. And the equalization of represented media on the interface occurs as this 
flattening differences of, of each medium, a process that Joseph Tabby and Michael Watts compare with Jean Baudrillard's, quote, ecstasy of communication, in which all secret spaces and scenes are abolished in a single dimension of information. And reprodu reproductive technologies threaten to erase all alterity and metaphorical distance in favor of mass-mediated sameness, unquote. So Arena Orojewski reveals the implications. Quote, Once the medial difference is no longer given, i.e. it's no longer discernible, any discussion about intermedial practices in given medial configurations becomes pointless. Unquote. Towards seeking methods to then reveal media differences to the subject, I'm e really equally interested in uh, revealing the processes whereby medial sameness can occur. And this returns us to the function of immediacy and digital remediation. By tracing the relationship between content and, and, and the material medium over the recent history of technological media, one sees that with each new stage of inscription technology, or, or what uh, Friedrich Kittler refers to as discourse networks, content is made increasingly abstract in a process called um, in a process of, of, of dematerialization. We can actually start with Walter Benjamin himself to demonstrate what dematerialization is. In his 1936 discussion of the destruction of an artwork's aura in the age of mechanical reproduction, he argues that the erratic experience of an individual act artwork that is situated to a specific space and moment in time, it, it's, hilar it's um, historical singularity, is destroyed through its exact mass reproduction. And part of the historical singularity that Benjamin describes of the work of art can be understood in terms of remediation as the content of the former object is reproduced in another time and space. And in this process, it becomes disassociated with its original material medium. Continuing on in like the history of photography and cinema, someone looking at a photograph or watching a cellular movie is separated from the recording process as uh, the, they are and the content is physically removed from the apparatus of the recording camera. And in the case of cinema, they're also uh, separated from the cinematic projector. So um, <coughs> Alan Liu continues the history of this development by looking at the most recent stages of inscription technologies, in which he argues that uh, there occurs, quote, the separation of content from material instantiation or formal representation. Following the advent of mechanical reproduction through to digital reproduction, Lou notes that content is separated from formal materiality because of the systems of, um, of content management in computers, whereby the production and transmission of content on the screen is not presented when a, when a user is receiving that information on the screen. We don't really get to know, we, we're not made aware of how hardware works or software works when we're using a computer. And the screen in this sense, or a computer today in, with, the, in the, with the wissy wiggy interface, the screen in this sense contains the time and space of virtual embodiment and of represented medial sameness. And the effect of immediacy then makes invisible the techniques of digital production and transmission that themselves erase the materiality of different media, and then all in an effort to um, offer this illusion that, um, uh, that mediation is in fact not occurring. So in other words, the act of inscribing one media in and for another, an act that writes a medium as immediate and, and that evokes its respective inscription practices is simultaneously the act of erasing the differences between media. Materiality is therefore what I think of as a really crucial element for enabling the effect of immediacy because it must first be erased. We see this in the principle of new media that Lev Matovich uh, describes as the aesthetic of seamlessness, which supplements the medial sameness of the interface. And Volter and Brusen also describe this aesthetic through computer designers' ultimate um, desire for what they describe as an interfaceless interface. So I became interested in intermedial texts specifically because they offer an example of the attempted comparison of media and, 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 and the understanding of their specificities in an age when media can be equalized upon the street. And as such, I became interested in materially enga engaged methods for how we might renew the subject's material awareness of the intermedial text, uh, texts, starting with a reconsideration of what we mean by intermediality proper. 
1965 and later in 1984, Dick Higgins uses the term intermediality to describe, quote, works which fall conceptually between media that are already known, unquote, such that two media are what he describes as fused conceptually. But the con as conceiving of the space between media as, as a space of fusion risks flattening their significant alterities, I argue that the space of intermedial encounter must not be analyzed in terms of blurred lines and consequent unity. Instead, it must be fleshed out for how we can highlight medial di differences within the intermedial. And in order to understand the salience of difference in intermedial practices and in, 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 in reading intermediality as such, I turn to Irina Wojcicki's work on literary intermediality. She delineates three types of intermediality for how they can constitute different medial relationships um, and for how they can be understood relative to liter literary intermediality. So it's literary, it's intermediality as medial transposition, intermediality through the combination of media and intermedial references. Of the three, Wojcicki focuses on intermedial references, arguing that an intermediate quote, an intermedial reference can only generate an illusion of another medium specific practices. Unquote. This this quality that she describes um, as exhibiting this uh, figurative mode of the as if helps to distinguish intermediality from remediation for the, the former's continued presence and reception of intermediate of medial difference, with Rajewski describing remediation as a particular kind of intermediate relationship. Intermediality not only accounts for the effects of immediacy and hypermediacy for remediation but it can also make the reader ask what is being presented as immediate in the intermedial reference, which is uh, the referenced medium as if it is actually there. So framed in this way, intermedial references function through the reader's recognition of the referenced medium through its significant alterity. And whereas in mixed media, Higgins argues that, quote, one knows which medium is which, unquote, in the case of intermediality, the reader recognizes reference only as such, um, as such, only through the understanding that one medium is different from another. Thus, expanding upon Higgins' description of intermediality as the fusion of media, an idea that potentially flattens medial difference. In fact, I think that difference is a crucial aspect of reading a text as intermedial in the first place. Additionally, Lars Elström has argued that media, quote, are both similar and dif different and similar, and intermediality must be understood as a bridge between media differences that is founded on media similarities, unquote. Where, and I think that he's highlighting the presence of medial difference in the very space, this, this space of Higgins' conceptual fusion. Um, in, the con in a contemporary culture that practices media borrowing, blending, connectivity, and convergence, among other forms of media representation. I focus on a particular kind of intermedial text, contemporary print intermedial novels that precisely resist equalizing the media that they represent. What distinguishes each novel's use of intermedial reference is the dissonance that's inherent in the material instantiation. The material medium cannot be erased from the re reader's reception because it is physically in their hands. And in this way, the framework of the intermedial as um, rather than a fusion of media, I'm reimagining it as an encounter between media. Uh, and this begins to explore the dynamics of media representation as one that's not necessarily as straightforward as an inscription process like transcoding, translating one to another, or um, that it can evoke a consequent effect of media as if they're the same. Instead, it's, I'm, I'm thinking of this as a, a, dynamic, so it's, uh, between, a dynamic between media that's fraught with potential tension, slippage, and dissonance. And to demonstrate my reading of this dissonance and how it brings about media aware material awareness, I look at one example. Jonathan Safran Thor is extremely loud and incredibly close. Just checking the time. This 2003 novel is about a nine-year-old boy named Oscar whose father has died in the 9-11 attacks. Oscar documents his thoughts in a journal, which include photographs that appear as inserts that are printed onto the pages of the novel. In viewing many of these references in conjunction with the journal in which they appear, the novel creates the illusion that the reader is holding the letters, pages of paper, notebooks, or photographs mentioned by the character. 
and in some cases, the reader can even imagine that they're the same documents. The function of materiality in the novel, specifically through its inherent medium of paper, lends its intermedial references a tangible experience that is aligned with the illusion of media and media practices that each evokes. So I want to look at the effect of photographs in particular. Uh, at the end of the novel, Oscar is grappling with the irreversibility of time and the temporal, and at the same time, he's, he's touching his journal and thinking about the temporal linear, linearity of the found book. Uh, he rips out a series of pages on which he's stuck. Um, <coughs> well, okay, that's sideways for some reason. Anyway, um, he rips out a series of pages on which he's stuck sequential photographs of the well-known falling man an anonymous victim of 9-11 whose uh, jump from the North Tower was recorded on video and later depicted in photographs. Oscar reverses the order of the photographs from the end to beginning and describes an imagined reversal of the day and night that his father dies, in which instead of like going to work, his father goes home instead of to work. He goes to bed instead of waking up. He wakes up instead of going to sleep. He tucks Oscar into bed and then he tells him the story and that's their last encounter. And the novel ends, the text ends here, but the last pages of the novel consist of the reversed photographs. And as the reader flips through them, sort of like a flip book, the falling man actually puts, appears to float up through the sky. And for the reader, the novel's themes of time, trauma, and ineffability are represented in these intermedial references to photographs. But importantly, the haptic sensation of holding the novel's paper adds to that thematic weight and in particular, there occurs this alignment of perspective between Oscar and the reader that allows for a shared spatio-visual experience of handling the journal pages and flipping through the photographs. Affect is drawn out of this experience that allows the reader to emphatically share Oscar's perspective when the reader imagines that they can feel the paper he feels and see what he sees. The traumatic loss of Oscar's father is felt that much more strongly as a narrative effect and affect through the haptic experience of flipping through photos that metaphorize the resurrection. One way of explaining this effect is to discuss how in a medial reference or difference is revealed when intermedial re re references engage in crossing the borders. I would argue that the condition of medial difference relies on the intermedial reader's prior knowledge of medium specificities. This is their literacy in and, and cultural expectations of a media system that allows them to recognize references to other media. So they're being in on the illusory as if the character of intermediate texts. In an act of border crossing, it is the specificities of each medium that define the practices that are evoked or crossed over in an intermediate reference and that thus allow for the illusion of evocation. This um, crossing signals uh, something critical about medium specificities that would you see does not explicitly identify uh, that intermediate references must carry the inscription functions and practices of a media that they represent as a sort of residue. The illusion of media practices in, in intermediate evocation is a de desired effect that arises out of medial difference when an intermediate reference attempts a, this crossing of media borders. Yet, um, I think in thinking, uh, considering what is crossed and how it's crossed suggests that intermediate references attempt to overcome difference. And at the same time, uh, they invoke that difference in order, in order to function. So in that sense, difference is being crossed and also cannot be successful in crossing. Uh, Rajewski points to this paradox by building on Heinz V. Hedo's work on cinematic writing in that, quote, Using the media-specific means available to him, the author of a text cannot, for example, truly zoom, edit, dissolve images, or make use of the te actual techniques and rules of the filmic system, um, or that I would add of the symbolic systems of any medium. Uh, and by necessity, he re remains within his own verbal or, or textual medium." Unquote. Framed in terms of its being a condition and divergence of the intermedial reference, the inscriptive, inscriptive functions and practices of referenced media, including the effective immediacy that they're able to produce, can be understood as this residue that the intermedial reference must carry, whereby the practices are residual in that they remain in the mode of as if, not truly one or the other medium. 
I'm just going to quickly sum up my thoughts. Uh, as our current media situation is one in, of intersection and referentiality, and the print novel can be treated as just one medium among other that others that is up for grabs. Um, I think approaching intermediality through these ideas of dematerialization and, and uh, dissonance, slippage, juxtaposition allows us to speak to just, for instance, literary scholars who are trying to understand the narrative and novel in, in terms that are not limited to traditional literary study. And it also allows us to speak to media scholars who want to reread media histories and materialities in this age characterized by techno-economic newness or medial sameness. In thinking about media representation or relation as, as media encounter, I'm approaching media inscription as this act that occurs in the theoretical space in between media, um, in their liminal space, the intermedial, literally the in-between. Uh, the identification of this liminal space is informing my hermeneutics of the intermedial, examining this as a site of encounter, inscription, and potential difference. And insofar as the intermedial is this space wherein one medium represents another, so to invoke the illusion that it's, that, that represented medium is present and to evoke its um, representational practices. I'm, interesting, I'm interested in how this can incite a reader's material awareness, namely their awareness that the intermedial, this in-between space, is in fact a space of erasure of, of, of uh, materiality and, and a space of the erasure of medial difference. I'll continue to think about these things a little bit more, but I welcome any feedback. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. I'll uh, ask a first uh, question, which is about uh, materiality. Uh, if you can, um, so I think it's very interesting that you are a way of, uh, of uh, addressing the, the question of materiality, but uh, if you can clarify um, a little bit, how do you employ the term? because it, it poses a lot of problem um, and what's what the relationship between uh, the materiality and the media specificities uh, is materiality something something which emerges uh, from the clash of uh, different media specificities <coughs> or is something uh, which is given but you know uh, I, uh, can, can you say more about material and mater materiality I think talking about something that like materiality is with regards to media media is uh, at both both always at the forefront of what we're, of what we mean because it already kind of shapes the medium in which we're talking about and this is a very rudimentary idea like McLuhan's the medium is the message but at the same time what is being suggested and the way that I'm using materiality as part of, is is as part of this existing discourse in which we are talking about moving away from materiality uh, through visual and maybe through like image culture in that it in encourages us to forget the materiality of, of, a, of, a, uh, represent, of um, a representing medium. This doesn't really, I mean, it can, we can talk about just uh, the history of painting in which um, there, the, I think it's called the Albertian window the uh, idea of an effect that, that there is no frame. Um, it's already, there's already this tradition in which we're not trying to think about materiality. But when I talk about materiality, it's not only just the physical platform or, or, or in, in this case, the interface that is offering the content or the information. I would also like to, and I think to be responsible, like to offer a context of other ways in which we can think about materiality and, um, when I bring in issues of erasure, and uh, I'm also speaking to issues of invisibility. So they are written initial erasure and then therefore um, invisibility of the material of the medium, but also the uh, other aspects of materiality that are erased as part of like media infrastructure. So material resources, um, people who are have to mine the resources to create my computer and, and, and like, even things like its battery. Um, material, context of material production um, in which there are, um, I, I did a project in the fall on the life cycle of the iPhone and uh, thinking about the mining of cobalt to create a lithium ion battery all the way to the production factories in China that are assembling these things and then 
how we get how we consume these phones materially and then they get like kind of I don't know, we're gonna turn around and it's gonna be the iPhone 57, but our like iPhones are being thrown out all the time and what happens to those materials? So I'm imagining materiality. When I, when I uh, started the talk, the talk explaining that I'm thinking about a media ecologies in a multi-dimensional, multi-layered way, I have to account for materiality as it occurs economically in a global sense, in reception, culturally, rhetorically. So that's how I'm understanding materiality. And then, to speak to the second part of your question about the relationship between materiality and medium specificities, uh, I think that there is potential for revealing that difference, and and to like um, that specificity can only come out of an understanding of difference because otherwise it would be the same. So, uh, what's interesting then is how for me for digital technologies is how they kind of put it all in the same platform or at least it offers that illusion uh, in the process of consumption but I think um, maybe instead of I've, since I've already kind of spoken about how that that uh, equalization can occur I, I'd, I'd kind of like to talk about how that clash can occur even in the digital because I've talked I've talked about the print novel which is something that we get to hold in our hands but trying to evoke medial difference in, in digital technologies is something that's much more hard because I have to kind of work within the medium, kind of be within the system and try to implode it. So what I'm working on right now and part of my postdoc project is in, um, a development of material awareness through locative texts or locative media. Uh, I'm specifically developing locative apps that people can use because of the ways in which they reinsert us into physical space and might make us interact with material objects and material space, places and spaces and objects that are fraught with historical, cultural contexts and specificities. Thank you. Other questions? So I unfortunately missed the first. Thank you for a very, very interesting and very thoughtful looking paper. And I unfortunately missed the first second. So I just came here when, when or first minutes. Well, there was something about the VHS, so probably you have already answered my question. That my, my question was if there is this sort of uh, tendency towards dematerialization, at least in the, uh, in the surface of, of, of uh, media discourse or uh, media expressions, uh, what is the relation between this dematerialization and the, the almost fetishistic relation to the noise of various media, and at least analog media, that are the noise being remediated, so to speak. I mean, this was exactly what you were mentioning when you were discussing VHS. I don't know. I saw a still with an image of the, the remediation of VHS. Um, can, can I just clarify what you mean by the noise? Yeah, well, the noise. So the, the, the simply, well, it depends on which medium, but the, in VHS it would be everything that's <clears throat> that that uh, relates to the failure of its supposed function to represent something semi immediately. So everything that well, Bolton Grusin, I guess they would uh, classify noise as the hypermediate aspect of, of one of the hypermediate aspects of the media. But it's, I mean, noise is a very complex, uh, both as a concept and as an actual phenomenon. But in VHS, it would be the jumpiness of the image, the, the, the dropout, the, the hiss, the, all that. That's an interesting question that I think is, that I'm, I'm, I've been considering in relation to the fetishism of like retro media or yes. fetishism of analog media. Uh, and, and in that, the reason that that is such an interesting question is because they're at, at the same time that these, that digital technologies can encourage us to sort of sink into this idea that this that, that these things are actually here. In in that sense, it's um, uh, remediating VHS or like a sonograph or um, even things like calligraphy and, and Polaroids on on computers kind of throws a wrench in the whole idea, for me at least, it throws the, a wrench in the idea that um, these older these older media are supposed to be coming obsolete, uh, they're supposed mm -hmm. to be 
uh, moving towards obsolescence. Mm -hmm. Because in instead, what we see is this like cultural reemergence of a lot of interest in 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 uh, older forms of technology. Uh, then I recently came across. Um, I was recently at a conference in which someone pr proposed this idea of the post digital to me. But that kind of comes out of art specifically, but it was this um, kind of fun look backwards into analog technologies, but using digital technologies to do so. And it's kind of, it's, 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 uh, it makes sense to me to kind of use, to use the same technology to reveal its own, to, you to use digital technologies to call attention to how they themselves remediate older technologies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ironic, but um, uh, I think dematerialization is certainly, or rather the awareness of, of dematerialization and, and the awareness of medial difference is certainly possible that way. But uh, I, I like this concept of noise. So I'm gonna try to think about that a little bit more. Um, what I will say then is just, against this idea of immediacy, the cultural interplay with, with people and how they use the technologies, that's kind of another level of how I'm thinking about media ecologies. It can't just be the direction of, you know, all the, the of the direction of history and uh, the, the direction of visual representation history, the direction of how these technologies are being developed. And have, it also has to be a question of um, how are these technologies being used by everyday people and how can they be used in subversive ways? Um, there's, there's something else I wanted to add to that, but I can't quite remember. Maybe I will talk to you about that during the cocktail hour. So, thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, next uh, um, speaker will be uh, Yari Kaupinen who is a, a professor in sound design, and uh, he's also a doctoral student in the Performing Arts Research Center at the University of uh, the Arts uh, at Helsinki. So, uh, yes, we have this little <laughs> exercise here first. Mm -hmm. No sound, right? No. Try to just uh, unplug and replug. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And the title of my presentation is The Voice is Out of Joint. And in it, I will attempt to analyze the interaction of human voice in, in performance and, and media technologies and create new perspectives to these issues. My use of the term performance is quite broad here including the performing arts and many other kinds of performative situations. I will use as my point of departure this quote from Gilbert Simondon, which is here. And the effect of the issues of amplifying and mediating the human voice have remained surprisingly under recognized and under theorized within the field of the performing arts. 
the technologies employed in the reinforcement and mediation of sound on stage have often been regarded, regarded as supplements, something avian to the sense of the performance. The anal analysis of mediated performative voices on stage still, still seem to produce the worn dichotomies of liveness versus mediation, authenticity versus reproduction, and presence versus absence. This notion of Gilbert Simondon that culture has made itself into a system of defense against techniques in which the defense is presented as a defense of humanity, supposing that technical objects do not contain human reality, seems still to hold true. How is it possible that the analysis and interpretations of the nature and effects of the mediation of the voice remain so limited? My hypothesis is that the creative and artistic possibilities and qualities of the media technologies still remain largely unseen in these analyses. The workings of the media technologies are black boxed with choices and assumptions upon, upon which these technologies are built are hidden. My practice as a sound designer is closely connected to technology. So the central point of my interest, in, interest at the moment is interrogating this technological condition, understood here as the philosophical description of the technical world, not only of the culture in general, but especially of the performative moment. In the practical and artistic dimension of my research, research situated within the context of artistic research, <clears throat> I examine and experiment with different strategies of combining voice and technology in performative context. My concern at the moment is how to devise a more productive framework, one that would consider the technological as a possibility, a tool and a method to present something fundamental about this technological condition, and how, at the same time, avoid the activation of the theoretical battleground of two millennia of philosophies of signification and presence of the voice set in opposition, opposition with a century of communication theory and philosophy of technology in the arts. What would Simon Dorn's notion of the human reality embedded in the techniques offer, and what could, what could the appreciation of it establish? <clears throat> As examples of strategies of analyzing the role of the media technologies in general, and in the specific case of the mediation of the human voice, I present the analytic frameworks of performance presented by Philip Auslander and Erika Fischer-Lichter. They both seem to agree on the fact that media technologies posit a significant ideological and ontological tension within the performance. They also argue that the media technologies tie the performing arts to the political and economical powers present in the society. Fischerly sees media, technology, media technologies as a means to expand the societal control to the area occupied at the moment by the aesthetics of the performative, and thus something to be alarmed of and opposed to. Auslander sees the tension between performative presence and media technologies differently as a symptom of a larger phenomenon the hegemonic struggle for the domination of the spectator's apprehension of the performative situation within the culture of economy. In my opinion, both Auslander and Fischer-Lichte fail to perceive the poetic capacities of technology. Their readings and analyses regard the mediation processes and technologies employed as something immutable and opaque as conduits which in their operations treat the mediated of its presence, immediacy and authority. What both analyses fail to grasp is the fact that the technological medium is not 
and mutual conduit of information, but as Jonathan Sirstern has remarked, an apparatus, a network, a set of relations, practices, people, and the technologies. The problematics of present do not stem from the simple opposition of liveness and mediation, but from a more fundament fundamental dynamics. The act of vocal address on stage has been the moment of the articulation of the voice, opening the passage into the interspace of bodies and discourses. It is this very nexus that the mediation disrupts and untangles, easing the voice out of its connections to body and language. The assemblage of speech, embodiment and presence previously considered unitary in space and time dissolves in front of our eyes and ears, leaving the constituent parts floating around. What we hear is not accounted for by the visual appearance and vice versa. This development is in no way in no way unique to the performing arts, it can be recognized all around us in the media saturated schizophrenic everyday reality. Never before have we heard so many disembodied voices and words. But could we presently be in a situation where the whole concept of disembodied voice is outdated, as Stephen Connor suggests? Could it be so that the violence, the mutilation implied in the concept of this embodiment is excessive and pointing altogether in the wrong dimension? Connor goes on to suggest that we in fact should reverse this thinking and speak not about schizophrenia but of panophonia, not about the denatured as Patrice Paris does or the lifeless as we shall live does or mediatized as Auslander does, but about the new vocalic bodies that get born in every mediated voice. A situation not of a missing or a severe body, but a multitude of bodies. An ecology of corporeal, mediated and virtual vocalic bodies of different kinds. An abundance and augmentation. Bodies appearing and disappearing, bodies of differing qualities and quantities, lengths, depths, widths, volumes, and densities. I will now outline a research methodology proposal. It will attempt to create a site of poetic dynamics within the process of mediation through both the theoretical concept and practical process of transduction. It focuses on the instance where when the voice encounters and crosses the electric boundary on the processes and generative possibilities of that moment. It is that brief moment where the expressive possibilities that exist in the ecology of voices, languages, sound, and technologies actualize. This instance is the first of the transductive processes active in the performance situation using media technologies. The other is the moment when the media object, in this case a sonic object, that is the mediated voice, emerges from the electronic domain. Here, so, so that we have this actual sort of live voice, and then the area of transduction and the electronic domain here, and then the other area of the transduction, and then the media object. This creates this like interconnected ecology of the of the mediatic situation on stage. And now we go here. And the practical application of the 
concept is realized with transducers, in this specific case with microphones and loudspeakers. Microphones convert the pressure variations into variations of voltage in an electronic circuit, and the loudspeakers convert the variations in voltage to pressure variations in the air. I apply the concept of transduction in a two-dimensional strategy as a technological concept within the field of audio engineering and as a linguistic translator logical concept. The origins of the linguistic rendition of the term can be traced to Roman Jakobson's threefold division between different categories of translation. He distinguished the intralingual translation or rewording, the interlingual translation, that is translation proper, and the intersemiotic translation, which he denoted transmutation. And the category of most interest to, for us now is the transmutation. Jakobson still relatively narrow concept of intersemiotic processes has since been stretched, especially by Michael Silverstein and Hinda Borley, to include not only the transmutation of verbal signs into non-verbal sign systems, but also the reverse operations. Here are some, some terminological uh, distinctions. This stretching has grown into its application into transcreativity in artistic word, work as an exploration of the rational and irrational structure of artistic intermediality. In Gorley's text, this process is called transduction. And she goes on to write, transduction is the new term that relates to the parallel of translation not applied to language, but within the intermediality of species of non-linguistic texture. So, <clears throat> then on the other hand, the concept of transduction within the field of electrical engineering denotes the process of transduction, transducing a signal which is a process by which variations in one physical quantity are quantitatively converted into variations in another. And here the transduction is understood as a straightforward quantitative process from one physical quantity to another. We are not, however, dealing only in physical quantities or the transmitting of information in the artistic processes. What is the dimension that I, as a sound designer, need to work with? What is the event or gesture that a certain moment in a performance produces and offers as material for me to work with? Surely, it is not a question of the pressure variation in a certain point of space and time, not of some abstracted quantities of linguistic information. What may be essential is something in entirely different from pressure variations or conveying information. It may be a certain atmosphere, a feeling, inflection of the voice, the density, and effect, perhaps. My practice tackles transduction in the same twofold manner. If we regard the linguistic intersemiotic transduction and the physical process of transducing as a conversion from one physical quantity to another, as two polar polarities of the field of transductive operation, an interesting terrain of creative possibilities open up. What could this me all mean in practice? It means unpacking the black boxes of technologies, in my specific case, the sonic technologies, both literally and conceptually. This method methodology takes as its points of departure the act of deconstructing a tool to understand its, its workings, 
and to reconstruct it in a personal, creative way. It is also a man manipulation of and provocation towards existing techno-semiotic structures, towards a different end, to get inside cultural systems and make them do things that they were never intended to, intended to do. Like this. So here we have a picture of a like, normal commercial mixing console. And now we could regard it here as in a normal state in quotation marks. It's boxed and it's defined and it's locked. But then if we then proceed to this like deconstructing activity and explode this like like apparatus or black box of technology which is like predetermined in, in, a, in a very defining sense then we get this exploded mixture which is in a porous state enabled to interact with many more agencies made accessible in a much larger variety of affordances. This is something that I have constructed as a kind of a conceptual primitive model of these possibilities. And then if we take a little bit further, then we can also start to construct these like ecologies of or, or networks of these primitive operations that are normally not in our easy reach in this like in these uh, actualized technological sonic tools uh, but when we are opening this a lot of new uh, creative possibilities of interacting with them and new and uh, different kind of possibilities, possibilities come up and now i would be really interested to hear your opinions of Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a question about uh, um, what the relationship between uh, um, transduction uh, processes and uh, uh, discretization and in particular sampling. Uh, we were talking about uh, analog and digital mm. this morning. So, mm. what what do you think about what's the role of of sampling and discretization and uh, um, what you are showing here, it's not perhaps the uh, uh, discretization you are talking, yeah. you're thinking no, about. This is like a talk. reverse operation I, in I, a sense. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to hear you about that. Well, first of all, I, I, I see that transduction in, in this sense that I'm, I'm kind of handling it as a, like a much more primitive process and, and, and also a tool towards deconstructing these, these notions or ideas of, of, of the technologies and their possibilities and what they are doing and what they are implying when we are using them. Mm -hmm. And then the discretization, I would say that it's like a much more difficult mm -hmm. like technological dimension to grasp in this way than mm -hmm. I'm working at the moment, but it's certainly something that we are thinking about the post-digital or, or, or something like that, then it's, uh, of course, it's something that's also being worked on in, in this same, like, guerrilla manner, in the sense that it's used. And it's, it's a little bit different from this, like, this nostalgic, nostalgic mood or nostalgic inclination towards the te technologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I enjoyed the very much your talk. Thank you very much. The question I have in mind is uh, the illustration with the void technology mm. as object of research. You have two transduction in it. Mm. And uh, I suppose it is intentional that you have two, two teeth, two red teeth mm. uh, instead of one. Mm. Could you explain a little more? Yes, uh, it's. It, it's based on on the idea that these like these two operations they are like 
but uh, they are opposite in the sense that the first transduction is is converting something acoustic to something ele electric or electronic and the second transduction is then kind of reversing this operation because it, it's trans transducting from the domain of the electronic signals into the domain of the acoustic so that in this process we have if we are talking about the human voice for example or the mediated voice so that we have this like the original live voice on the other hand and then we have this mediated voice which is then has gone through these two processes of transduction and of course in these two processes the possibilities are are really different in the sense that in the first transduction when when the like the voice enters the electronic domain then there are certain things are possible there and certain things are done there and then on the second transduction then it's much more about the like the space and the, also the acoustic quality of the signal or the mediated voice again so that it's then we are like dealing with different parameters in these two transductions sense different technologies also but Can i have a second question sure uh, when you uh, refer to Jacobson and uh, talk a bit simplest time so, and Dorley yeah those are really uh, hard notions if i can use that word like uh, transmutation intermediate intermediate Meta creation, semiotic transduction, and transduction. Um, maybe you said that through your presentation. It's maybe that I'm not that clear. I think you don't understand it. But do you uh, do you do you mix all these notions, and do you think they are really separate, and that we cannot synthesize them? I think they are more like a progression, but perhaps even a, a, a historical progression, or or, or like a theoret theoretical progression in a sense that this is like something that has been evolving this terminology so that the, I think the last stage at the moment is the transduction for, 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 because all of these different usages of the terminology are then also framing this Intermedial translation a little bit differently, and the possibilities seen there are also a little bit different within, within these, these people and this research and these usages of these terms. Other questions? So, thank you very much. Okay. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Aaron uh, uh, Finbloom, who is a philosopher, performance artist, musician, and one of the co-founders of the School of Making Thinking. So, uh, Aaron, it's to you.
and what about now? Does my voice tell you more? Does my voice disclose to you my gender, my age, my race, my ethnicity, my sexual preferences, whether I identify as a male or a female, whether I am a nice person or not, whether I am bored or not, whether I am passionate about what I am saying, whether I couldn't care less, whether I am just saying these things to arouse you, whether I am genuine, whether I am to be trusted, whether I am someone who should be listened to. And what about now that you perceive my body? Do you still need my voice now that my body is here? We know Phaedrus, writing shares a strange feature with painting. The offsprings of painting stand there as if they are alive, but if anyone asks them anything, they remain most solemnly silent. The ideal of non-interruption in the guise of politeness fits the interests of the monological, solitary, and isolated subject. Through non-interruption, the monological subject tries to maintain the illusion of total self-reliance, autonomy, and independence, primarily independence from others. Such a subject wants to think of itself, not him or herself, since it's impersonal, solely from within, as necessary and unique, as indivisible and individual, exemplifying the light of reason. Science shines forth from within itself.
One might say that to a certain extent, mutual interruption is characteristic of dialogue in general. This assertion, borne out by experience, is all the more justified insofar as dialogue is constituted undetermined by the very possibility of interruption. Our participation in dialogue is determined by our expectation of being interrupted by our awareness that an interlocutor is preparing to respond by our fear that we might not be able to say all that we want to say. <laughs> yeah. Why, Aaron, did you choose to present this material which leads us towards the dialogical in such a monological manner? Why mobilize the myth of liveness, the presence of the body, the timbre of the voice, the distinction from the textual, all within a monological encounter, to merely create a straw man to then be dismantled, to posit a center to then be deconstructed, to establish a reductive claim to then be attacked? That monologue provokes dialogue, even if such provocation occurs internally, for a dialogue accompanies every monologue and always wants to interrupt it to break its usurped and solipsistic speech. Moreover, a listener cannot abstain from reacting to the uninterrupted flow of either oral or written monological speech by means of facial grimaces, gesticulation, notes, underlining, or any other form of expression, whether mental, oral, or written, that the listener can manage. Sometimes interruption as a provocative disruption of a monotonous or outright corrupt action takes the form of cynic diatribe, ancient in Diogenes, modern in Gordy, that is utterly, that is uttered publicly and intended to cause a scandal which should necessitate the continuation of dialogue. Has anyone interrupted you before?
It's the first time I presented this, so uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, actually, some some uh, uh, thoughts uh, just to uh, to start uh, the conversation with you. Uh, uh, it's kind of uh, challenging because uh, uh, um, just my my feelings is that that uh, uh, you ask a lot of concentration. Uh, mm. It's really demanding as a, an exercise. And actually, I was uh, thinking about what you you said at the, at the end of your uh, monologue, uh, which is uh, what the fuck? I, I, I can just say uh, I don't want that. <laughs> Please stop. And why I don't do that? Because we are in a format that everybody knows, and uh, and uh, uh, we were waiting that you are you are finished. So uh, I don't know what's the place of of uh, in in your. Um, analysis of the relationship between monologue and dialogue, what's the place of institution? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I kind of wanted to exist within the institution and kind of like play with it from the inside. Uh, I guess I was just like giving nods to sort of Derrida's playful way that he does deconstruction all the way through. So that's kind of um, where I was coming from. And yeah, I think I sort of explored a little, a little bit within the talk of like why like, I think a, a really interesting question for me is how one can be within the monological and and sort of like, sort of, ex almost like explode that, that dualism, that sort of neat dualism from within. So that's kind of what I was trying to do. Thank you very much. It was very demonstrative. Um, I think in a good sense. Um, I thought about the why we don't interrupt. That's because you're stating this as a performance, and we are mm. we are used to creating on some the performance end before we we interrupt. So mm. I think that's because it's that we choose this kind of format that makes it very difficult to make the interruption actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I thought about your your saying that. Correct me if I'm wrong. That the voice, in a logical sense, does not make relations. Only dialogue does. Was that kind of one of the arguments that you? I think that any material, voice, text, body, any of these can be both dialogic and monologic. It just yeah. depends on the situation. But yeah. I would say, and this is made a presentation on, on almost the same subject, that, that the voice always, when it speaks, is relational because you you can hear yourself speak when you speak, and and then that. But I think your your presentation actually. Um, demonstrated in a very, in a very nice sense because I felt much more dressed when you raised your voice than when I read your words mm. on the paper. Yeah, so I think that the voice in itself, I think it's Adriana Cavallero that says that the voice is genuinely creating relations every time we use it. Yeah, um, I would, I would just want to like tread cautiously down that path because that's the very path that Derrida it takes all the time to deconstruct. Not, she's, she's, Building on, uh, she's making a distinction between orality and vocality, uh, and she's she's not she's it's interested in the materiality of the voice, right? And I think it's not in the necessarily in the inherence of, of the bath and brain. I, I think she yeah. means something different with it, um, but I'm not sure. But that's a longer discussion. I know if exactly what what kind of path you wanna want us to leave uh, and have have some some of the same interests. But I, I think your presentation showed it very genuinely that the voice, I don't know if you had the same experience, but, but I felt addressed in a totally different manner when you raised your voice and when you didn't. Yeah, you yeah, I would, I would agree in a different manner. But yeah. I, I, I'm just, I'm hearing a little bit of the of, of this sort of elevation of the voice as having a certain like liveness or presence that a text doesn't have. I think that's a rhetorical intensification, I would call it. Rhetorical intensification of the situation, intensifying the situation. And yeah, it's, and it's an, it, I just want I to push up. against that. <laughs> just because that's, I mean, I just, I want to move away. I just, I feel like there's a, the, the live presence dualism sort of happening there. And I, that's sort of like what I want. I want to move away from that dualism and work sort of like intermediately, you know, towards the monologic and, and dialogic. Yeah. But like, that's but just I'm, my. I'm not, uh, cool. I think. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do the same, but I just think that your presentation is 
application, like all of it. Mm. But this works as an effect. I don't say that yeah. this is the, the genuinely, uh, um, what do you call it, a Gary Dan uh, photosynthesis that's mm. at stake here, but the effect of the voice is, is still <laughs> working. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear other results. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there's a question yeah. there, then there, yeah. and then. I was going for the performance too, but I don't think it's just because in your case it was a real performance, just the way that uh, we are organized and the format of the conference is a performance. Mm -hmm. uh, may I be a bit technical? I think mm -hmm. then when you speak, we add, add more time to see the text mm. and yeah. so uh, when it was just the X sometimes I, I, I it was too uh, rapid I can't yeah. I, I, I didn't have the time to read it all so I think it played there too but maybe you can think about the way you use that mm. yeah totally so um, I, I am the I feel challenged by your presentation for many, many reasons. Um, it is very demanding uh, to follow the, just mm. the reading as she's uh, talking about. Because when you read it, you have plenty of time. When it, it, you have to read it, you have not enough time. But uh, my, uh, it's not really a question, it's more a, a comment. Uh, while it was going on, you know, I was reading and reading, uh, reading most of the time because uh, it, it, it makes me, it makes my memory as a reader come, come through. And there was a sentence that I was very, not only one, but provocative. <laughs> it is uh, writing a book is malignant yeah. because you cannot answer it. And you know, I've studied that thing. Uh, <laughs> he talks about the dia the uh, dialogical posture of, of the, the, the writing, the polyphonic voices within the text. Mm. So a question emerged. Do you adhere to all the statements <laughs> that are in that? Yeah, I'm so glad you picked up on that. I think that was probably one of the more provocative moments. Um, <laughs> And I'm really trying to tease that out for me. And I, and I, and in fact, in my sort of like exploration, my path of, of exploration of this, I, I wasn't finding what I was looking for in Bakhtin, and I actually found it more in Jakubinski and authors like Rakor, um, because what I'm really interested in is the sort of performative dimension of the reader and and the and the writer, you know, and that lived relationship between those two those two entities. And I and I don't find that in a, in a book, I hear what you're saying, and like the, the polyvocality is located within the text, you know, so you'd have to locate it there, but it's not paying attention to the, the reader-writer um, interaction, which I'm, that's what I'm, I'm more invested in, so. Yeah, thank you, this is, yeah, it's very thought-provoking and, and, and super interesting experience, I and mean, it's really a sort of frame-breaking event. Uh, I was thinking, so, so if I understand you correctly, you, you want to sort of nullify the, uh, the, the difference between the spoken and the, the written in some sense? You want, you want both media, so to speak, to be experienced identically? Did I understand? Because your answer there seemed like you were provoked by the idea that there is a liveness to the voice. So the sort of follow-up question is, I mean, the, the fundamental difference between a, an already written text and a performance going on is that there is a space for the accident, chance. Or interruption. Or interruption. But even the, the chance of how you read or how you stumble on some, some of the words. So, I mean, there is always the element, and there was actually, not to be pointing out. So, the, so the, the, the element of the accident is always, isn't that, it, isn't that one of the sort of, essences of, of liveness if we are if we accept liveness as a phenomenon if there's that's fascinating i haven't i haven't thought of that that's really really interesting um i'd want to think more about that yeah 
just to follow up on exactly what you said, um, I'll be presenting tomorrow and I'll be giving the same example, so I apologize in advance for the position, but authors who would appear on television in the, 19, in the 1950s wanted, wanted to read everything because specifically exactly what you just said, and they did not want the possibility of being interrupted or messing up something. They wanted the word to represent them as they wanted. They wanted it to be true. And so they want they didn't want to allow for chance or or any mishap or any misspeak. And eventually we saw this authenticity, that the realness of this word that is fixed as as kind of fake. And and now we consider the spontaneous presentation as something real because mm -hmm. the accident is what reveals the true something, something true about the person speaking. So you have that same um within the television media, at least relating to authors, you would have the same kind of tension. Sorry, I'm just going to kind of uh, think about what you're, I'm thinking about what you're, uh, what you're saying about pushing back against this idea of realism. Maybe just as a suggestion, kind of jumping off of the original conversation, like one, Conversation that it's almost went tangential. I'm going to kind of approach it this way. But um, I, uh, when you're talking about dualism, I'm imagining just kind of in the way that Derrida thinks about it, and in the ways that he's thinking about it, and like I think even with his cat as an, in another example, mm -hmm. the animal that therefore I am, it has such a foundation in like the, I, the Cartesian dualism, this idea of like mind versus mind and body. But that um, has been Kind of tampered with through media studies in a way that might be useful in because um something like sean ward sean with the U, he talks about you know, this idea of the digital doubling of of, of of place in that uh there is through you know, using multiple media in your case trans being transmedial offering text offering visuals offering the recorded sound and offering your own voice there is an ability to think about position of reader and writer not only as like one in, on, on one level or one plane, which is how Cartesian dualism works in you know, like a unidimensional way, but also to think about what it means to be here, like physically we are here, but then there is another here that might happen. Like for Sean Morris, it's what the digital here, or just as a really easy example, when you're using your, I was talking about like me using locative stuff, your GPS and you're using it on your phone, it tells you you are here, that here is not the same as you physically being here. So there's that doubling that um, there might be a way to address that dualism because it's a dualism that happens doubly. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I would love to check out for that. I, most of, there was one line about like electronic literature putting a wrench in this and I, I Catherine Hales is mostly what I, you know, uh, techno texts and that sort of idea of what electronic literature like pushes back against like a linearity of text is mostly like what I've encountered in terms of I guess is is she in the media studies? She's there, so. like she does she's a jack of all yeah. trades. Okay, yeah. That's <laughs> a, I mean, I would love to check out uh, that author thanks. So. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking of um Fishy Vice's little book on questions. Do you know that? Oh, say it again. The Swiss do after still fishery and vice. You heard of them? No. I've written a little book of questions. The most wonderful about those is that the questions are effectively the questions you've asked yourself all your life and you've never dared to say. Oh. And it reminded me a little bit of what you've just been putting there together in relation to writing, but the answers you're giving now from famous philosophers. Mm. And I'm interested in the hierarchy between those two. Mm. Why, why did you put those actually very internalized questions against those, you know, kind of like canonical texts? Um, yeah. Why the canonical text? I mean, my background is in philosophy, so that's like what I have there. And it's only in the past like three to five years that I'm sort of, I guess, in my academic training, moving outside of like sort of canon and sort of, you know, I, I maybe like the answer is like, I'm getting there. <laughs> I just find it fascinating yeah. that there were suddenly a voice of authority set against this very right, personal language, yeah. isn't it? I guess, I, I mean, the whole question of citation is something I'm also really interested in. And my background's in analytical philosophy, or originally it was, and, and there's much less uh, citation in, in, in 
analytic philosophy, it's more just, well, it doesn't matter who you cite, are you being logic, rigor, rigorously logical or not? So, thank you. Just a quick work because I think time is flowing uh, away. Um, going back to this uh, idea of tunnel vision, because I said maybe that could have been an entrance for you for the lightness aspect, because I really enjoyed the idea to think about lightness. Mm -hmm. And even if you're more interested in the voice, when you look like um, a broadcast of September 11, for example, you had like the witnesses on the phones in you know, the mediatization of the event, the real life mediatization event. And they saw much less than we saw on the screen most of the time. So it was all the time like a dialogue between the witnesses, the journalists being witnesses, and uh, with the spectators' witnesses. And finally, the experience of the live event was mediated, was much more real than being on the scene. So maybe there could also be an entrance on thinking about more of the voice, just like mm -hmm. input. It would be more visual in the sense because of television, but still I think it's interesting because it could underpin what you're trying to deconstruct, I guess. That's right, yeah, it's super interesting, thank you. Last question. Thank you, um, it's just uh, your, your um, performance just made me think about the, uh, something that I find quite fascinating, which is the weirdness of uh, conference presentation as a performance genre, uh, <laughs> particularly in the humanities. Um, because one of the features of that is that when people are speaking, to me, to me in uh, conference formats. I'm thinking about what they have written on a piece of paper, so I'm kind of receiving their voice as text. Kind of the voice. And also the, the, the way in which the PowerPoint or the, the slides are often um, competing with words. And so sometimes you'll have the thing of a, a quote, which is also said and you kind of read ahead of the quote, or you're being distracted by the same words being spoken by the person who supposedly is authority but you're, you're kind of ahead of them by reading their words on the screen and it also reminds me just thinking about monologues and uh, and dialogues of um, I'm talking, thinking of um, Derrida it just reminds me that you probably know of how Derrida would do his uh, lecturing which he wouldn't call lecturing he'd call it seminar and he would read and uh, the only way in which it could be called seminar is that people could interrupt and he would stop and wait very respectfully and thank them and then carry on like his letter. <laughs> and there was no moment of asking questions. And he called that that was his seminar. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean the the exactly what you what you, as you started speaking about, like the the mode of the of the conference and, and that sort of um performance. I I'm very interested. I'm very interested in this the notion of the sort of mode of address, um, which I just found this, this lovely uh, Aristotle quote, which is like saying that um, we don't need like sugary things when teaching geometry and that like we don't need to think about the mode of address when we're actually doing rigorous, like logical and theoretical things, you know, and I, so that it goes back so far within the West, this notion that we don't need to think about how we're saying the thing, it's just like get the thing out, you know, um, and I, I'm, I'm really as I'm also, you know, very interested in pedagogy and these sorts of things. So yeah, it's, it's nice to you both. Thank you. So thank you very much, Aaron. <laughs> and our last speaker, I uh, leave my place, <laughs> is uh, Philippe uh, Teofandis. Uh, Philippe is uh, an associate professor of communication at uh, Glendon College at Campo uh, at uh, a campus of uh, York University in Toronto, and uh, he holds a PhD in communication studies here at the University of Montreal. So, Um, I can talk, <laughs> I can do many things in the same time. So um, um, Aaron, thanks a lot for many reasons. I, uh, I didn't ask any question, but in a way it's a dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing maybe I'd like to, to uh, 
underline or note is that it, it was more than we were due for a, a presentation about presentations, right? There are so many media conference where the presentation has nothing to do with presentation. It's a representation of the text that's written. And um, so uh, it's really important. And the other one is um, the interesting remark about the accident. And this morning we were talking about authenticity. And when you see a scratch on a film, it becomes more authentic for some reason. If the whole thing is scripted, um, then maybe you lose the authenticity because you don't have uh, space for accident. Um, so fortunately for me, I haven't written anything, so there is plenty of space for, a, for a, a, an accident. Um, thank you for staying. It's the last panel of the day. It's like almost 5.30, so thank you a lot for staying. I promise if you stick with me and you stick together, I promise you a, a, a video of grizzly bears scratching their back on, on the trunk of trees at the very end and it will be relevant with the presentation <laughs> uh, especially with Heidegger um, so we'll see now you're all, all intrigued this is a uh, you you know maybe the video Richard uh, Richard Serra 1968 uh, hand catching lead okay for observation first there is nothing that is being caught grasped or catch once and for all because it always fall right second then the grasping, the catching, is a continuous process. It's not grasped and then it's done. It's a grasping really in the transitive way. Third, at some point, you can imagine that when he released the lead, it's actually the lead that drops from the top of the frame. At some point, if you look at the video, you wonder, is he trying to grasp? Is, is the crux of the matter here is grasping or is it releasing okay because both are at work grasping and releasing fourth there is nothing nothing is being taken there is no appropriation because it always drops right except one thing the improper the end is dirty right i don't know what happened after the video but richard sarah before going for dinner he must have washed his hand, right? The lead, dirty is the end. So the only appropriation from the part of the end is the dirtiness or the, impro in French, I would say, impropriété, okay? This, I hope, will, will serve a, as an illustration and, and I'm looking at you because maybe you can correct my, my, uh, my German. I don't have any German. <laughs> This maybe will uh, will serve as an illustration uh, of, of two key concepts in, uh, in uh, Heidegger, which is Geleisenheit, the releasement, and Ergriffen, which is the, the grasp, okay? Uh, behind, you have a new painting. It's the only classical piece in the whole presentation. After that, the grizzly bear. <laughs> Titian, beginning of the 16th century, the uh, famous parable, right? It's uh, Marie Magdalene uh, trying to touch Jesus Christ after the resurrection, and Jesus Christ says, you know what he said, right? Don't touch, like the famous song, don't touch me. Okay? <laughs> in Latin, noli me tangere. Okay? In this, at, at this moment, which is the beginning of the presentation, we can see, we can read it the classical way. Marie Magdalene, we all know her rep reputation, right? And the Christ, she is like, oof. <laughs> Back up, don't, don't touch my very nice white gown, right? <laughs> don't touch me, don't defile me, okay? Maybe that would be a first way to understand the subtitle of the presentation. Defiling authenticity. Uh, in this sense, authenticity is the patient which is being defiled, right? At the end, we will try to reverse or invert this proposition. Like everyone, I guess, you wrote your proposal. What, what was interesting about uh, the conference? Uh, the title, which was carefully crafted to provoke, right? Uh, authentic artifice. In the, you've seen maybe on the website, it, it is said that it is a, a paradox. Okay. Another way to talk about it would be a figure of speech, the oxima, the blinding darkness, something like that, right? That's an oxima. 
if we had time, we don't, but if we had time, <laughs> I would suggest there is a third way to read authentic artifice, and it is as a pleonasm. Pleonasm is, I don't know in English, in French, I would say monté en haut. It's a pleonasm because you repeat two times the same thing, right? Authentic artifice is a pleonasm. You're saying twice the same thing. You can demonstrate this using the etymology, but you need to cheat a little bit. If we have time, we can go uh, uh, with the etymology. The paradox is interesting because it was a suggestion of the, the proposal. Can we think this paradox, this collision of the two words differently? Is this paradox a way or an opportunity for us to think about media in a different way? If we want to think about it in a different way, then we need to depart from the position where authentic artifice is an opposition, right? That's the classical opposition. Truth on one side, truth on one side, falseness on the other, or fake. I, I'm waiting for something to, someone to make a reference to fake news. It will probably <laughs> happen tomorrow. But since we're talking about authenticity, those are the classical binary opposition, right? If we want to think about media, and maybe uh, even more to the point in intermediate, we need to rethink this articulation. Then, hence, the question. If authentic artifice is not a contradiction or an opposition, how can we think about it? What could be the relation or the articulation? What I want to propose here through Heidegger is the idea that they relate through or they perform a modification. Authentic is not the opposite of, or of artifice. Authentic is the modification of, of artifice. Why? It's interesting how we, we, we will do that. I, I, I will do it through Heidegger, okay, very quickly. Why it's, it's interesting, it brings us to, it will bring us magically in like the next 15 minutes, 10 minutes, it will bring us to a point where it is possible to think about, there is a couple of uh, end results that are interesting. Third, the first and most important for me, and it's in this direction that I'm working, I've been working for the, the couple of years, it allows us to think media as mode. And, and at some point, I'm looking at you, media, uh, through the idea of modal ontology, okay? From there, we can understand mediation as modification. From there, we can also understand mediation as mediation. Medium is the space, right? Medium is a the space. Then mediation is spacing, okay? And more importantly, maybe if we want to relate with, with uh, the performance around share with us, mediation as presenting, presentation, which is an interest, interesting point to arrive at because usually mediation, it's always secondary in relation to presence, right? A presence which is mediated is represente. On the contrary, if we go through the little demonstration, mediation could be presence itself and more specifically presenting and even more specifically because there is never presenting alone, it's always, now since we spoke about Derrida, always already co-presenting, okay? <coughs> There's already too much in the talk, but that's uh, how it works. So uh, we will go through the, uh, through the motion. Um, we talked about, uh, I think you talked about it during the, the presentation uh, in the afternoon, right? Um, Klein, jumping in the void. The first step, um, um, uh, we face, I face the proposition of the conference and I'm wondering how can we think about authenticity and inauthenticity in a way where they are not opposed. Fortunately for us, it's been done before, <laughs> okay? And famously, or I shall say infamously, because it's highly problematic, right? I'm, I will introduce the, the figure of Martin Heidegger. So you shouldn't be surprised if the, the last set of, of slides is about ethics, okay? Because we, 
don't raise the specter of Martin Heidegger without care, especially since the past, the publication of the Black Lung books. But we won't go into this directly, but it's always there, okay? There is no way to separate both. So Heidegger offers a way to think about authenticity and inauthenticity in a way where they are not opposed to one another. The first step to understand what he's doing is the most crucial one. Okay, you can uh, read or think or hear about Heidegger and, and you will hear people saying Heidegger, you think authenticity is extraordinary and inauthenticity is the das man, the day, it's derogatory, okay? Fine, it, it may be in the text, it's one of the most famous debate about being in time. Was Heidegger being prescriptive or descriptive, okay? If you go read the text, I read part of the text. I'm not an Heideggerian, okay? But if we go read the text together, we will see that Heidegger on multiple occasions says, be careful, do not understand inauthentic in a derogatory way. Do not assign a value to, to inauthentic. Try to understand it as a concept. Then what does, in a, it's super hard to do, right? It's counterintuitive. We think about inauthentic, it, uh, always, uh, already it's fake. What does the concept inauthentic can tell us if we don't see it as a value, but as a concept? Authentic is what is being made by itself. Aftos, it comes from the Greek, right? Aftos, like in automobile. It's, it runs by itself. And, and entes, it works by itself. Interestingly, authenticos in Greek uh, uh, used to mean murderer because he was able to act by, it, by himself to kill or the person who would commit suicide because she would take her own life, okay? Authenticus is the one who works by itself. Then, very simply, inauthentic means not by myself, right? Inauthentic simply means not by myself, okay? It means, it's very interesting to me since I'm working in communication studies, it means in common, I am not alone, right? Inauthentic means not sovereign, not standing alone, in relation. Inauthentic means in relation. There we have a standpoint where we can understand inauthentic in a non-derogatory way, but as a technical term, meaning in relation, meaning common, meaning maybe community, okay? Of course, Heidegger wrote in German. <laughs> he never used the word authenticity or inauthenticity, right? Okay, that's the English translation, also the French tr translation. There, is, there are very good reasons to use those words for the translation, but in, in German, it's different. My, again, forgive my, my German. Uh, for authenticity uh, in German, it's eigentlich, eigentlichkeit, and in inauthenticity would be uneigentlichkeit. And this relates some translators, some commentators of, of Heidegger, uh, uh, including Roberto Esposito, uh, uh, Giorgio Agamben, and Jean-Luc Narcy, uh, uh, from which I take a lot, uh, everything. <laughs> take everything. They have stretched the fact that it should more closely be translated as authenticity, ownness. It is properly mine, it is my own, that's authentic which fits with the uh, Greek uh, etymology of the words. Then, it is proper to me, it is my own. Then, inauthentics mean it is not proper to me. It is, inauthentics in a literal translation means improper, which is interesting. We arrive back at the problem. Then, authenticity and inauthenticity. How can we relate them? Heidegger says the design become authentic when, uh, that's a crucial point in Heidegger. He said, authenticity does not float around inauthenticity, right? <laughs> the design become properly designed when, and that's the, um, now you'll understand why Richard Serra in the beginning. When he grasped and modify the inauthenticity. Heidegger will say, authenticity is a modified grasp, grasp of inauthenticity. In French, 
une saisie modifiée, modification en mode, right? It's all, all well current and argument. <laughs> so, in us, authenticity is a modified grasp, which is, a, which is interesting. We should keep in mind also that in Heidegger, despite he spent only a couple of pages, it's all about design, right? Uh, being in time, design there, design there, and then authentic design. <laughs> there is only a couple of pa pages where uh, Heidegger will insist there is no design without mid-design. The being with, or mid-design, mid-design, okay? It's, it's not a property that exists outside or a predicate of design. It is part of his existential structure. There is no design without mid-design. The inauthentic for Heidegger is the das man, the the, the, the common. We'll come back to the double sense of common, the common. The design become him, himself when he discovered that his own most property is the fact that it is improper. He is improper in the very strict and clear meaning. He discovered that his fundamental structure, there is no fundament, there is no foundation, there is no property. His Fonda foundation is the absence of foundation. It is improper, it is the common. In other words, the property of design is his improperty. The ut utmost, the most authentic property of design is the improper, that is the common. This will be the path that will be taken by Nancy since at least the, the 1980s. And then later, uh, also by Agamben with uh, extraordinary uh, synchronicity, and also Roberto Esposito, to say that human being, their only characteristic, it's not to the language, it's not that we have developed technology, it's certainly not like Ch Chomsky says that we have moral. They will say each time you have one of those property, it always degenerates into catastrophic community, which is we are the community of those who have this property, right? And you don't have it, so you stay out. Jean-Luc Nancy will come and will say, the only way to, to um, diffuse this situation is to recognize the fact that what we have in common is not something, it is the nothing, it is the improper. It is something that is lacking. That's what we have in common. Agamben will use that a little bit later to uh, and with some uh, also controversy, okay? Uh, that's not to say that there is an ethics. Uh, Nancy will call it the originary ethics in Heidegger, okay? Agamben will also call it an ethics. By the way, that's, uh, that's Agamben with Heidegger in 1966 and 1968. Uh, Agamben uh, went to two seminars when uh, Heidegger was teaching at Le Tard uh, in the house of uh, French poet uh, René Char. I'm, I'm going to cut short because I want to show the grizzly bears. So <laughs> I, I, I won't expose the Viritas Patifacit Ipsan et Falson. The, the two minutes. But, it, but you have the, the whole story I, I just told, you have it compressed in, the, in this things, which as usual, like Agamben never gave the, his reference, but it, it's, <laughs> it's in Spinoza, right? Truth manifests itself, Patifacit expose itself as it exposes falseness. Spinoza, uh, when you go back to Spinoza and, and you read where he used this, approximately this, it's clearer in Spinoza. If you light a candle, you have darkness. It, it gives you the shadow, the darkness around it. What we're having here is the, the idea, the constraint, we cannot separate truth and falseness. They go together. The same way we cannot separate authenticity and inauthenticity. They go together. Okay? They are no more in a relation of opposition. They are in a relation of modification. So Agamben will say, we will have ethics only and only when we will understand that the good is a modified... Yeah, I'm, I'm quoting by heart now. I'm, I'm, it's a little bit different. It's a modified grasp of, of the evil. As long as we will try 
or we will feel or we will think that we can live in a good world by pushing away the evil, we will fail. The evil will come back. We need to understand that good is turning to the evil and trying to transform it. And we need to think in a position where there is not this separation between an essence and an existence, between property and improperty, between présence and représentation. So the neutralization of the classical opposition, as promised. <laughs> I'm, I'm finishing here, but if you want to see this as an example of ethics, I can explain how it relates to <laughs> presenting space ethics, ethics and, and modes. Because uh, ethos, right, uh, etology, it's the uh, study of the behavior of animals, right? In the behavior of animals, there is no behavior without a spacing that is going around in, in a certain area of the woods and marking your territory. Ethos is a process of spacing. And of course, you don't space your territory like this if you're <laughs> alone. You need others, okay? So always co present So uh, that's it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the story. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Philippe. Uh, just uh, in order to keep talking about uh, the, the bear. Um, <laughs> if you can, uh, yeah, okay, it's what I wanted. Um, for in, uh, when you read the Heidegger, the really difficult uh, thing, as uh, you said, uh, is uh, to try to uh, understand authenticity and the inauthenticity not in an ethic uh, sense. Which Heidegger asks to uh, to uh, uh, his readers, mm. saying uh, something like, "Okay, it's uh, there's there, there, there's no moral judgment, uh, moral yeah. and ethics different." Yeah, yeah exactly. It's what what, what I, I I wanted uh, you to uh, to say. So um, is so we have to abandon uh, moral, but speak about ethics uh, and uh, ethics uh, in this sense of of uh, behaviors. Uh, can you? Tell uh, more about uh, uh, what you you uh, said at the end uh, of your presentation, uh, like uh, ethics, like uh, uh, spacing or creating. A, a yeah, here it's it's literal, right? It's uh, behavior, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, ethos, ethos. If you go back to Aristotle and rhetoric, ethos is the the way. When in the rhetoric, there is three parts: the ethos of the avatar, the logos of the discourse, and then the pathos of the. So my way of being now, it's called ethos in, in Aristotle. So ethos is just a mode of being, okay? That's as simple as that. And it's used to name the, the behavior of animals. The separation between ethics and moral is absolutely crucial. You'll find it, it's not, it's not in, uh, explicitly in, in Heidegger, no? but you'll find Foucault worked really hard about that. And he was really careful each time, especially when he started uh, to work on the aesthetic of existence, right? He said, there is moral on one side. It's when you take a, a normative value, you place them uh, there, and you say you should behave according to those values. That's one thing. Ethics is something else, although it is clear that it's absolutely conflated nowadays, right? When people talk about bioethics, what they mean is biomoral. What set of rules should we have to frame our activities with uh, the genome, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Foucault said, no, 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 we need to separate. There is something else than, than just behaving according to a set of rules. We could behave adequately <coughs> toward ourselves and toward the other. That becomes le souci de soi, right? The care. So ethos is about that. It's about an adequate behavior, an adequate way, an adequate style. Adequate towards what? Adequate towards a context or a space here. Okay, it's adequate for them, this ethos because they need uh, they're not just having fun right they're scratching their back because they're marking the territory that's the distinction of it i'd like to know how you're connecting the two richards richard Avedon and richard sarah <laughs> ah um um uh, i have a lot of fun doing those slides right yeah, uh, yeah, when i, I do slides that. i have a lot of fun um, because it's the the photography of Avedon. it's a coal miner yeah it's from the american west yeah exactly so i thought the, the dirty hands, 
uh, with the mineral, uh, the, it's lead, right? But then I, I moved to the coal miner because they just came out of the end. There was the, the hand also, the dirty end of the other, so I was still having grasping. It's all very thoughtful uh, and organized. <laughs> That's how I relate the two uh, return. There's also a very famous, you can find it uh, uh, online. There's a very famous reproduction of, a, a, it's also the same series about the miners. It's the, the face, and then and we, we can have fun, but uh, we will stop. Face, facere, it's the same facere, fire, face is the same uh, etymology, right? Artifice is artifactuality, right? Okay, it's to make the face same thing. So the face of the father, who is the father of two young miners, is all circled with red pen. It's a famous story uh, uh, online, right? Red pen, and it's Avedon telling his printer uh, overexposed there, underexposed there, over, and, and it launched a con conversation online about, oh, so he faked his photography, no? They are all Photoshop. Is it Photoshop before Photoshop? Avedon was not a <laughs> true uh, portraiter, no? He manipulated everything. What's the nature of the real? So th there would be something else to explore. Other questions? Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you so much. Wow, I, I was just like, as you're going through, I would like have a thought and you'd like answer it with what you're saying. Um, I guess I'm, I'm really curious about the sort of the inauthentic and authentic within Heidegger. And it seems to me like I was, I was, I was glad you brought in the Nazi because I wanted to bring that in. And um, the, the being singular plural right, is, the, is the text that, does, that deals with this. And it's interesting because I think within the Heidegger, what's, what's happening is even though there's no Dasein without the Mitzein, there's this sort of like this progression. There's this idea that like, well, we're thrust into the world that we're, we're sort of like, we, we are inauthentic. But like, if we do this, if we make this like certain progression of like grasping and modifying our inauthenticity, then it's like almost this like elevated way of being authentic. And I sort of like read in, into Nazi like a, a sort of like wanting to push that away a bit and wanting to say that it's like we're always there. Like the way we start is the way we end. There's it's sort of this like this flattening of the of the of the dualism. And I don't know, I just give your response to that. Um, yeah. The reason why why I came back to Heidegger, not the reason, but how I came back to Heidegger, it's through Nancy. Mm -hmm. And I, I would advise for it because Nancy is doing it in a very, very careful way, in a very, very intelligent way. Of course, Nancy and and there is a raging debate about Heidegger, right? There, there are scholars who are calling for us, the other scholars, never to quote Heidegger again, right? Because <laughs> it's a witch, and I shouldn't say that, but it's it's really it's heavy. Whereas uh, Nancy will recognize right away that there is a, a major problems with Heidegger. And, and he will make the good move of saying those problems are not a side dish of the main philosophical work. They are right in the philosophical work, and that's how we should approach. The main text for this discussion, I would say, is prior to uh, être um, uh, singulier pluriel, in French, uh, it's la décision d'existence, the decision for existence. And the decision in, uh, in French, but it's the same in in English, it's um, an operation by which you make an open it. Okay, you decide. And Nancy very, very um, elegantly will link the this this decision is the decision by which the design grasp the inauthentic and become authentic. Okay, mm -hmm. but Nancy will link this with the decision you have to make. We have to make when we read Heidegger, and we decide. Is this an authentic text? How do I approach the text? You're absolutely right, and Nancy also underlined. He just published a book about the banality of Heidegger, right? The banality of the, he was a com, commoner Heidegger in a way. And there is a progression in being in time where Heidegger says, "Do not read this uh, in a prescriptive prescriptive way." And then he said, "Get the the small talk people, the yeah. das man." And at the end, in the last maybe 20, 40 page, I don't remember exa exactly. He says that the community has it, its destiny, right? He, he starts talking about the, de the, the, the authentic destiny of the community and, and we are on the verge of 
it's uh, 1927, but 1933, uh, he goes on and he, yeah. So there is there, um, um, I won't say, and now see, uh, he doesn't do it either. I won't say that, that it's clean somewhere and that you can uh, slalom your way without touching the pole. It's all in the way and that, that makes the reading interesting, I think. Oh, okay. Other questions? Okay, so thank, thank you, very you very much, much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We have a, a cocktail right uh, uh, there. And uh, so we can rest at the end of this <laughs> <laughs> very full uh, day. Thank you. thank you very much. It was really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Je vais faire ça. Ça va être. Ça va être.